this is sort of a weird analogy, but just like Figma has designers and non-designers, like readers and writers that are two different user types, Tinder really only has one, which is people actively dating. What if you could create this second category of Tinder user? Welcome to this week's episode of Unsolicited Feedback with me, your host, Fareed Mosabat. This week, I'm joined by Mariah Moscato, an old friend of mine who I used to work with at a company called Runkeeper and who is now director of product at HubSpot. In part one, we talk about dating apps. We spend a little bit of time talking about Tinder, focused on a new feature they are calling Share My Date which allows you to share your location and information about the dates that you've matched with and where you're meeting them in real time. We talk about this as a safety feature, but also talk about how this might branch out to open up Tinder to other use cases. Some of our takeaways from this is that one, they're leaning in on an existing customer behavior, something high friction that people are already doing and trying to make it simple and productize it. We talk about how it might unlock new use cases for Tinder to start building around the people who are in dating adjacent communities versus just those who are actively looking for partners. And we talk about the virality and possible network effects that might come from this. I hope you find this conversation exciting. I certainly did because I'm not someone who's been in the dating app scene really ever. So I learned a ton just breaking it down from a product perspective. I know we're like 20 minutes in and I'm still in a hallway. I can That's okay. The guy um, I'm speaking to said he was on his way 15 minutes ago. I just asked for another ETA, but I can just do it from the hallway. Like, yeah, this is working so far for the riff part. <laughs> this is the fun of this podcast. It's pretty casual. <laughs> it's probably worth explaining why you're in a hallway. So you're at HubSpot. You just moved to Dublin. Why? Yes. Like, why did you make that decision after uh, you grew up in Boston? Like you've been there your whole life. Right? So I grew up in Boston, uh, but my family is from Ireland. Uh, my grandparents specifically, they emigrated over uh, to America. And so I've always been interested in getting my Irish citizenship, uh, which you can okay. get if your grandparents were born here. So I actually got my citizenship in 2020 because I was like, I'm young. I think I was like 29 at the time. Yes. And I was like, I want to live in another city. I never did like travel abroad. I never did student exchange. I never had any of those experiences because I was to focus on being a good student and getting good grades. So my time to really live it up is in my 20s. So I had all that paperwork approved. I was working with my manager, Renee, at the time on transferring to the Dublin office. And there's a lot that goes into that. And went through the whole process. And then March 2020 happened. And I think the story kind of tells itself from here. But we waited until June. And I remember my manager, Renee, came over to me and she was like, hey, Mariah, I know you want to live and go to Dublin, but do you think that's still a good idea? And I go, no, it's yeah. not a good idea because not only did people get forced out of the offices, a lot of folks were moving out of Dublin into the suburbs. Got it. So I had a lot of friends that were working in the Dublin office, but then they weren't anymore. So it didn't really make sense. And then I realized, I think at the end of last year, because I took on a new position at HubSpot, I'm leading all of our fintech teams. And two of the three groups yeah, within FinTech are based in EMEA. And then two of my leaders are based in Dublin. And so I was here in February talking to my friend Chloe, who works in recruiting. And she's like, Mariah, are you ever going to move to Dublin full time? I know you've talked about it a lot, but you never did it. And I was like, I don't know. Like, I have a house at home. I have a life at home. I'm not sure. And she was like, why don't you take advantage of HubSpot's global mobility policy, which means that you can work (laughs) from anywhere for up to 90 days. And I was like, that is such a good benefit from HubSpot that I do not take advantage of at all. And I'm still single. I'm now in my 30s, not my 20s. But I can't uproot my life pretty easily if I want to. And so I thought, why don't I take advantage of that and move to Dublin? And then, so I arrived on the weekend. I've been here for four or five days. I arrived during the most gorgeous weather of the year. So luck of the Irish right here. And why am I in a hallway? HubSpot Ireland has a wonderful podcast studio but you need special access to get into it, Uh, which I had access to earlier today. And they go, Mariah, just leave the door open on your way out and you can just step right in here at four o'clock ready for your podcast. But when I arrived here, the door was slammed closed and it's locked (laughs) behind me. So I messaged facilities and they said they're coming down to open the door for me, but I can talk from anywhere. So I'm in a hallway next to an elevator. 
All right. That's awesome. So one of the other things that came up, what we do on this podcast is we give unsolicited feedback for existing products and just rip on them. And one of the things that came up this last week that I found interesting, and you mentioned your signal, so I'm excited to hear your take on this, is Tinder announced a feature for their core dating app called Share My Date, which allows you to share details about your date with friends and family through a link. And This looked weird to me. Like I was a little like confused about it and curious about it, but I'm curious maybe as someone who actually like uses a product like this sometimes, I don't know, that's presumptuous of me or that has friends who do. What's the goal of this? Why would they do this? Do you think it's important? What do you think of the feature? Have you been able to try it yet? Yeah. (laughs) I'm curious about your thoughts. Yeah. Let me talk about all my thoughts and I am very actively dating. I'm using this podcast as my distribution channel to get more dates. And so hopefully this goes viral. (laughs) I'm aggressively single and I'm very much dating. So when I arrived in Dublin, I'm a chatty Cathy. I'm pretty transparent as they say. I'm coming into the uh, Dublin office and I ran into Anthony who is at our front desk. And I know Anthony from many years ago. And so we're good friends. And I'm like, listen, I'm new to Dublin. I'll be here for a few months and I'm going to date. And they go, make sure you do it safely. Everyone in Dublin will share their location, a picture of the person they're going on a date with, the name, the location of like where you're going, a bar, a restaurant, coffee shop, whatever it may be. And that's like for safety reasons. So I want to talk about why I think they did it, but I'm also going to talk about some crazy idea I have. So why okay. do I think that they did it? I think they did it for safety as an avenue okay. into maybe something else. And this is a wild okay. ass guess. So I'm going to say that out loud. I love it. Yes. This show is all about wild ass guesses. This is a really wild one. <laughs> and I don't think okay. anyone's going to agree with me. And that is a okay. I remember Fareed, not to go back to this, when we were together at Runkeeper, Tinder was like really popping off at that time. It was new. It had a lot of virality to it. It was a very popular app. And I remember you were like, I don't understand why this is so addictive, why it has such like good viral loops. But you also <laughs> couldn't use it because you yeah, have to be married with children. I'm a married man with young children, yes. yes. <laughs> and you are like many other people who are very interested in Tinder, like what makes it effective? But it would be socially inappropriate to log in to Tinder, right? Yeah. However, if you can get a lot of other people exposed to Tinder who traditionally should not be using Tinder, let me introduce this other concept that I see in all the dating apps, not just Tinder. And I think that the dating app technology should match or directionally marry to like how dating is changing over time. And I think what you see a ton these days that I didn't see like 10 or 20 years ago is ENM. So ethical non-monogamy or polyamory. That is extremely popular. And I don't think I understood that until I was on the dating apps and people are pretty upfront about it. So I would say like socially over time, more people are comfortable with ENM that I think there were in yeah. the past. And that is how dating is changing. That's how relationships are changing. And so the dating apps have to understand that. And they also have to right. directionally change their product roadmap to understand what is different about dating today that wasn't available 20 years ago. And so this right. is my wild ass guess. And it certainly is wild. Now, if you were in a relationship, let's say you met them in high school, maybe you met them in college, but you were committed prior to the dating app scene. You never saw the dating apps. You don't really understand what's out there. You shouldn't be signing up for them at all. And you should not be on them because there's so many stories regarding, oh, I saw your boyfriend on the dating app. You should not be seeing anyone's boyfriend (laughs) on a dating app, right? That's very- Yeah, and and it's real names connected for Facebook profile. Like there's a lot of things that you can't like lurk or fake, which I learned when I was doing my product research on this. Uh, I did actually download it. I played around with it and- an email notification showed up on my phone that said, here's your Tinder activation code. My wife literally saw it on my phone. It was like, what's this about? I was like, it's for product research, yes. <laughs> which it was. Yes. <laughs> but no, yeah. I remember that, anyway. that was a very <laughs> yeah. intense research project you were on. Exactly. But yeah, it would be socially not acceptable to be on there if you're in a relationship. Yeah. But if you see relationships as being more open, which they are these days, as someone who's actively dating, there are a lot of open relationships, tons. And if I were to give you a random number, we can verify this later. When I log into these apps, I would say 20% of them are in open relationships. That's not to say that people who have already committed to a partner might in the future be open, right? But they can't expose themselves to what's out there on the apps because, again, it wouldn't be acceptable to do so. However, if I share with you one of my friends who would never otherwise download Tinder because they shouldn't, 
wants to verify who I'm dating, that will now bring them into an ecosystem that they would have never been brought into before. Right. And if you are someone who's more open, so it's not for everyone. I think if folks are more into one-to-one -one monogamy relationships, this wouldn't be a good viral loop for them. Sure. But I think if folks are more open, and there's more than I think people realize are in open relationships, if they're getting more exposed to what's out there, I do think that would be a good viral loop for Tinder. Now, do I think mm -hmm. that's why they're doing it? No. I think it's right. for safety, but I did try to explore what are the other angles here of getting people who otherwise shouldn't be using Tinder outside of like, the Tinder best friends apps or any of those sure. versions that I think people are not totally bought into yet. I still think people see them as dating apps. A couple curious. interesting takeaways here. Yeah. I think one is it sounds like people are already doing this behavior mm -hmm. and they're basically productizing an existing behavior. And I love when products do this, right? It's like there's emergent properties, existing customer behavior that's hard and high friction because you have to do some work. I got to copy paste the profile. I got to type the thing. I got to say where we're going. I got to give the hours. I got to send it in a group text so that five people are there and they can see it. And I can say, holy shit, come get me or whatever it is. Call me and say there's an emergency so I can leave this place. And it's, hey, let's make that really simple. And what happens is you don't just lower the friction. You increase adoption when you lower friction because more people do it. And so you have higher engagement, but also in this case, better safety, which I think is great. It makes a ton of sense. I tried to think about, is this a sharing loop and driving virality? And I think your concept here of like the changing nature of relationships, I think is a really interesting one. So it's like, this is sort of a weird analogy, but just like Figma has designers and non-designers, like readers and writers that are two different user types, Tinder really only has one, which is people actively dating. What if you could create this second category of Tinder user, which is like, friends of people who are dating or matchmaking or whatever those things are. And all of a sudden you don't leave the Tinder ecosystem just because you stop dating. Maybe you're still part of it in some way. We're going to have the monetized core user base, but also this like satellite set of people who are doing something else or exposing them to these apps in a way that maybe they are open to. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll add to that. You asked if I used the feature. I, I cannot find the feature, but what I have used is you can share a profile. Good news, everyone. I did get a date. It's this weekend. Um, I knew <laughs> everyone, all of our audience members were interested. So I just want to give an update. But I did share the profile with my friend. And so what it did was it sent an SMS picture of the guy so she can still see what he looks like and be like, good, yes, no. And so I can get that feedback, but then it's like, you have to download the app. And she was like, I don't want to download the app. And she is right. single, but I will say with the dating apps, there's a lot to sort through. You got to qualify yeah. your leads. There's a long <laughs> sort of lead scoring mechanism that I put on yeah. my potential suitors. And so I do think there can be a lot of negativity that goes into the dating apps. And you'll hear a lot of folks be like, oh, it's taking forever. There's not a lot of good quality guys out there, but there are, you just have to sort through it a lot. And so I do think that yeah. Folks who are single or otherwise in other open relationships might be more apprehensive to even download the apps these days because you do hear a lot of negativity. Like there's no good people on the apps. I'm on the app. So obviously there are good people. Yeah. And so I do think like just sharing those profiles and being able to see or explore outside of downloading the app who is on the app. I do think that's another way to get people back into Tinder. Yeah. Super interesting. I, I, I think that these products that are very mature very large and basically like social networks have this sort of like trend wave to them have some really big important questions around retention user base being top of mind on brand and so it is hard to maintain it's like your best company customers churn because they're successful your non-successful people maybe get frustrated move to something else etc and it is fascinating that like the whole dating ecosystem seems to be consolidated under a single match umbrella because it is like, there's no winner take all here. Like it's by its nature fluid. And it is interesting that they've all each found their little pockets, but like all ultimately end up under the same <laughs> umbrella brand. Yeah. I was going to say a, a lot of them are owned by a match group, but if I, as someone who uses Bumble, Tinder, Hinge, I think those are the top three. Am okay. I missing one? I don't know. You see the that same people right. across all three of those. So you can match right. someone on Hinge, and you're going to match with them again on Tinder, and you're going to match with them again on Bumble. 
And so it is interesting because they are differentiated a little bit, but right. everyone's on all three of them because they want to up their hit rate in terms of getting a date. Right. And so you have to be on all the apps to really see what's out there. And there's a lot of other things that go into once you match with someone, what happens after that. But I will say based on the region and where you're dating, safety is a big concern. It's more yeah. of a concern for the consumer. I'm not really sure how the dating application itself benefits from that in terms of retention because I don't think someone's going to not use the app if there's yeah. safety concerns because that's an ecosystem outside of the application that's hard to maintain, right? right? Or regulate. Yeah. So I like that they're getting into that out of application experience versus just saying in app because that is the reality of dating. At some point, you're going to get off right. the app and get on a date. And so that experience hasn't really been tapped into by the dating apps so far. But in terms of like huh. retention, I have no idea what the long-term strategy is because once you're in a relationship, again, outside of open relationships where you're not going to leave the app, you're going to continue sure. to explore and you are seeing way more people in open relationships these days. Yeah, I think the key is then if you have a product that has a limited lifetime, right? Not to be crass about it, but like you either have super long retention, in which case your lifetime value of a customer is really high because your retention is low and you're going to keep them for three, four or five years. Or you have a short time frame, in which case it's your job to basically monetize that person as hard as humanly possible in the short amount of time you have them. Or drive virality so that you can keep your acquisition engine going as much as you can. And so certainly Tinder has, it, I don't know a ton about their monetization strategy, but I know they've done a lot in terms of different profile types and boosts and in-app purchases and all those sorts of things. It's interesting to me that, and maybe I'm wrong about this, but that none of these apps have moved into the next level of monetization, which is like setting up the real world thing. We should talk about this. Apparently there are like crazy mark, like black gray market marketplaces for restaurant reservations in New York City where bots go collect all the restaurant reservations and then resell them to people willing to spend hundreds of dollars to get like hot tables at places. This is, there was a New Yorker article about this week. And you can imagine a world where like, for a person setting up a date, like the willingness to pay for a awesome, interesting, exciting place to be could be really high. So you can imagine some price elasticity that they haven't done more on the facilitation side. Yeah. Maybe the safety feature is step one. It's, hey, here's us facilitating the real world experience and behavior and being a part of that piece so that our relationship with this couple doesn't end at the message. But actually, oh, you shared your location. Well, maybe you do that for a second or third, or maybe now we can set up reservations, activities, et cetera. Let's riff on that because location is what you brought up, right? What yeah. if the first step here is where are people going to meet up? Right. What is the most common place? I doubt it's a five-star restaurant in my experience, Farid. I got to be honest sure. with you. I don't think anyone's- Oh, I think this is just cool City. places. <laughs> it's not fancy. It's just hip places that it's that Yeah, they way, ain't taking me there. I got to be honest with you. But yeah. I do think like, where are people going? I'd like to find out myself. But like coffee shops, different bars. And then once you know where people are going, then you might want to exercise some sort of autonomy over that part of the experience. But yeah. I think maybe data collection could be the first step here. Again, I don't know if it's purely a safety- mechanism or it's more of a data collection mechanism because I would be interested to know where people are going myself. But I think what they might find a lot of coffee shops and a lot of bars and a lot of parks and a lot of walks. And I don't know how you yeah. monetize a walk. You don't. I don't know. You recommend it to start and maybe you go from there. So maybe it's not monetization. It's just like deeper differentiation, engagement, experience. At the end of the day, like the job of the app is it, it's a marketing platform effectively. Maybe you help someone market themselves better by coming up with interesting ideas or things like that. I don't know. Okay. So I don't want to go down this long road, but I'll start on it. It is interesting, like the curation that a dating app will try to do for an individual. For example, let me make sure that your best photo is always the first photo that a right. person sees. But if I don't have autonomy over that myself, I don't really get to organize like my storefront or my marketing as a human being. And you know what it really optimizes for? I got to be honest with you in my experience, bikini photos. And so really yeah. what it's saying is put your bikini photo at the top. And I'm like, I don't think I want to lead with that as a woman. Right. I think I want to lead with That's not what I'm looking for. Else. Yeah. And so yeah. I've been a little bit skeptical around them taking the reins over my experience because I do think how you market yourself does matter to a potential suitor. 
So I right. want them to get out of that business. I think I can market myself pretty fine, although maybe not because I'm still single. But I am hesitant that it's solving for the wrong things or it's optimizing for the wrong things, right. especially on the woman's side. Yeah, no, that makes a ton of sense. At the end of the day, it's all about what's the goal function of the little machine learning algorithm. Is it like getting the most swipes or finding the right long-term match? These things are very complicated. And yeah, super interesting. I'm always fascinated to talk about this corner of consumer internet because I think these apps are at the forefront of, honestly, some of the stuff we talked about with Time Shifter, right? Like, how do you drive engagement? How do you help people stay connected to something? How do you make it fun? gamey, interesting. They are almost like social games, effectively, right? But with real people on the other side. But they're an area that's a little dark to me (laughs) because I'm not in the target audience and I don't use it. So the same way it did a decade ago does now still feel like, hey, you have to stay on top of what's happening here because there are interesting patterns, lessons, et cetera. It's really good to see the amount of effort being put into like true safety here by these companies as well, because I think there was a stance that they could have taken. And I think maybe internet companies of a decade ago would have taken, which is like, our job is just a marketing platform and it's up to you to deal with everything else. But instead of taking an active role in that and really see it as almost like technical scaling, a responsibility that as we get bigger, we have to do these things to help the same way Uber has done a bunch of safety features. You you need these things to keep up with the scale and where like, if you have a hundred million users and 0.1% have a bad, a really bad experience, that's actually a a lot of people. It's thousands and thousands of them. When you were just talking before you mentioned Uber, I was like, what was the first consumer app to really get into the safety space when it came to matching strangers online? And that was Uber. Yeah. And so one yeah. could argue Tinder's a little late to the game because that was over it's a fair. decade ago that we were really considering the safety of two strangers meeting. And dating is, I would argue, even harder to monitor because it's not just a car that's going to a location. They could be going anywhere, right? Right. And some yeah. real creeps online. So being able yeah. to monitor that audience, I'm sure, is a full-time endeavor. Really good point. Like it's 2024, like Tinder has been a market for 15 plus years now. Yep. I'm actually surprised we're talking about it today. So I guess recommendations. Wow. Late to the game. <laughs> Takeaway two, they're basically taking an existing customer behavior as you described it, that people are doing and trying to lower the friction and bring it into the, to, to the product. And third, that this might be a way to introduce like non-active dating or dating adjacent audiences into the app and give them a full real reason to use it, right? And maybe there are other ways in which you might engage with it in the future. I think that's super interesting. So a little bit of a wedge here into a bunch of different stuff. The last thing I'll say, and we can move on with topics, is how did dating work a long time ago? It was likely an introduction from someone that you knew. And someone else's opinion does matter, especially someone that you value, someone who's close to you. What I also like about the sharing features is I value my friends' opinions, even the married ones, right, who can't use the app. And so being able to share a profile and say, what's your take on this person? Should I go on a date? Yes or no? That to me provides value. And if that also exposes them to an ecosystem they would not otherwise be exposed to, it works on both fronts. Yeah. Yeah. Like what are other common dating app behaviors that they could productize? One is, let me show you the app and let you help me decide yes and no on people. That is like very common. I would say it's probably one of the more common like casual contact type loops, funny videos of people in their family events, like putting it up on the big screen and like doing it as a thing. I saw some like viral video around that. Yeah, I've certainly done it with friends because I'm both curious and also they're like, what do you think of this person? What do you think of that person? I think as they think about what's next. I love this idea of these like adjacent, non-core dating, casual use cases. Again, to use the Figma analogy, the difference between designing versus commenting, reviewing, interacting is like that there might be two classes of Tinder users over time that they have different behaviors in the app. I don't know why there aren't more like Tinder hosted meetups, like singles meetups, right? Because one, the hardest part about the dating apps is getting a guy to show up on a date. It's not matching. (laughs) Matching is very easy. It's not conversing. Conversing is very easy. They'll talk to you all day long. But once you get to, do you want to grab a drink? Do you want to grab a coffee? Sure. Yes. Wednesday. 
And then Wednesday shows up and you're like, are you still on? They're like, I don't know. And so getting them yeah. to show up is actually the hardest part. I'll show up anywhere, anytime. You let me know. Yeah. And I will show up physically. I'm, I'm very confident in how I look. I'm happy to show up and see other people. But getting people to show up is really difficult. So if a dating app could facilitate getting people to one place and then also do some validation. So one thing that is really obnoxious in the dating scene is you match with someone, you talk for a couple moments, they freak out for whatever reason that has nothing to do with me. And then they unmatch you. If someone has a really high unmatch rate, I'm busy that day. I don't need to talk to yeah. you. Like you don't seem serious about dating. I want them to weed out through the human behavioral actions they already track, the people who aren't really that serious. And to be frank, right. there was a time five years ago that I wasn't really that serious. I was on the apps. I was like, I don't know. Like I'm still warming up to it. I'm in a different place now. And so back then I should have been eliminated from that pool because I was never going to meet up. I'll be honest with you. I was just on yeah. there to explore and be curious. I'm in a different phase now where I'm like down to meet up. Let's go. But I do feel like I'm matched because there's there's no heuristics there that where they eliminate people from the pool. Not that I can see anyway. And you get right. a really high unmatch rate. You'll be like, hey, my name's Mariah. They'll be like unmatched. And I'm like, I didn't even say anything. So I do right. think like being able to like weed out those people, bring high quality people together in a physical environment if they know where we're going. And then they could probably assure more safety in an environment that they can somewhat control. And they don't have to hire a bunch of employees to do this. They could have meetups and have people who are like, sponsors of that meetup in their local city. Yeah. I think local cities are the best place to do it. But again, the hardest part about dating online is getting people to show up. And if they get pe more people to show up, again, that kind of goes against their maybe wishes of retention because more dates mean more people leaving the ecosystem. Who knows? <laughs> but if I could get a date, I might speak highly of the service that got me that day in the first place. Yeah. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Unsolicited Feedback with our guest, Mariah Moscato. In part two, coming in just a few days, we'll be diving into Disney+. Plus. We'll be talking about their content strategy, what's working, what's not working, and the pivot that Disney is making towards being more of a tech company. Stay tuned.